Well, it happened, folks. We have all witnessed in 2020 the greatest wrestling match ever. I don't know what I'm doing. But Randy Orton vs Edge is in the books as is WWE Backlash 2020 and you know the deal, you know the law, you know the rules until we can decide whether it was a good show or whether it was a bad show. We pass all the power to this, my finger, that sounds really dodgy but it's going to give the good bits an up and it's going to give the bad bits a down. And well, just to give you a little bit of a spoiler, maybe I'm about to break my own rules. Dave Meltzer can do it with his star system, I can do it with my ups. Let's up those downs for Backlash. Are you kidding me? Because when I tuned in to the pre-show of Backlash 2020, we had put the US Championship match between Andrade and Apollo Crews on that. And I don't care what anybody says. I know there's like a small argument for, well, it doesn't matter where it is on the show. Yes, it does. Go back in history in your time machine and see the other things that have just been hurled onto there. You demean the championship within around about four seconds. It's getting a down. Thankfully, the match between Andrade and Apollo Crews was very good and Apollo Crews won. After Paul Heyman got kicked out the door, like late last week, I was like, oh no, this is bad. He's one of Paul Heyman's guys, and Vince McMahon's gonna do his dance of death, and it's gonna ruin Apollo Crews for the 422nd time, but he kicked ass here. Everybody calm down, give it up. And it was nice and simple too. Kevin Owens was here, and he was all dressed up smartly with a little bit of a tie to keep his eye on Angel Garza, who was at ringside. And as soon as Angel Garza did try and get involved, KO was there, he gave him a stunner that allowed Apollo Crews to give Andrade the powerbomb. One, two, three, still. The United States champion, the champion of the USA. And tying into what I did tell you on the Backlash Predictions video, we are now going to catch up with how I did. And right now I'm happy. I am one right and zero wrong. The main show then began properly and we had the funniest question of all time. So think of that, not only were we having the greatest match ever, but we also had the funniest question of all time. Because it was the women's tag team champion triple threat match do da thing in the jig. And backstage, Kayla Braxton was talking to Sasha Banks and Bailey and said to them, Guys, if you lose your tag team titles tonight, does this mean your relationship, your friendship is over? What a proviso to put on anything. I mean, imagine that, imagine that. Barry, Barry, if you don't hit those financials, me and the kids are going to walk out the door. And then that happens, and you've got to sit down with little Sarah and little Jimmy, <laughs> wink, wink, and you've got to tell them, look, I know you missed Daddy, but he was not able to hit fundamental statistics and fundamental metrics in a very difficult market. And then you've got a broken family. It's just too much. Once again, I don't know what I'm talking about. As for the match itself, well, the start of this pay-per-view, WWE was clearly in troll mode because we already mentioned how the US Championship was on the kickoff show. And here, Sasha Banks and Bayley retained their championships with the most devastating move in all of sports entertainment. The surprise roll-up. They've got to be doing those dice rolls like nobody business. Bring it down. That's number 41 on my roll-up counter. I had more fear here that maybe these two were going to lose the title, as I did a few seconds ago, so I was actually quite satisfied with this. And yes, Sasha Banks did use the most devastating move in all sports entertainment to pin Alexa Bliss. So we'll now see where they go from here. But all in all, apart from that nonsense, it was fine, it was decent, it was a good way to start Backlash, it could have it up. Plus that also means I'm now two to nothing in my predictions. <laughs> what a hero I am. Next up was Sheamus versus Jeff Hardy, and I can say this with a smile on my face, it just wasn't for me. Down. And it was alright to a point, but because of the finish and because of many strange decisions, it was lost on me. For example, at one point, Jeff Hardy was so mad with everything that Sheamus had done to him over the last few weeks, which is perfectly understandable, he teased using the steel steps and then changed his mind. Now, WWE is obsessed with non-finishes, as we are going to talk about later on, but here, a non-finish actually would have made sense because Sheamus has made Hardy's life an actual living hell. So if he had just snapped him and gone, I'm going to take that red hair and I'm going to try and rip it off your body and try and smash your face into this steel steps and then got disqualified, I would have been like, ha, huh, look at that. That's a smart use of a screwy finish that actually made sense in my brain. My brain is small and I'm dumb, but even I could have understood it. You don't care about wins and losses when somebody is trying to wreck your very existence but instead Jeff thought better of it and then tried to pin him in the ring. 
I don't know why it's bad. Instead, after around about 15 minutes, Sheamus did hit Jeff Hardy with a very cool looking bro kick because Jeff was running on the barricade and he threw himself right into it. And then back in the ring, Sheamus gave him another one and beat Jeff Hardy. So let's just go through the events and I'll remind you. Jeff Hardy had real life personal problems and we brought them into the story. Sheamus has been an absolute dick because of them and also beat him in the ring, which means Jeff Hardy is just some kind of loser and Sheamus is, I don't know, the magic best person in the world. And I know they're gonna have more matches and probably the feud will end with Jeff Hardy standing tall, but I don't, know, I don't really want to see them go at it again. I'm not that invested. and also means in my predictions, I'm now two to one because I went for Jeff Hardy win. So there we go. I know other people have liked it. I've seen you on my Twitter, but that is my opinion. And while my opinion counts for nothing, I do have the finger of power. We also learn more about Miz and Morrison's Universal Championship match later, and WWE really should have explained these rules on SmackDown rather than just throw them out here on Backlash, because Kayla Braxton told them, look, just so you know, you can't be co-champions. Whoever gets the physical pin or submits Braun Strowman gets the title. So it's kinda a triple threat match, but it's also not a get Otis and Mandy also appeared after this and teased that maybe they were going to cash in their money in the bank briefcase, but just to spoil the rest of the event for you, never see them again. WWE then did this to me. It hurts, doesn't it? It hurts a lot. Why can't people just win anymore? I mean, that is a wild exaggeration. Now my cheeks hurt, but it was Oscar by Nia Jax for the Women's Raw Championship. I mean, I've got the words wrong there, but you know what I'm talking about. And it ended with a double count out. Down. I'm just gonna give you the short version so you don't have to suffer like I did. Oscar applied an armbar to Nia Jax, which forced Nia Jax to fall out of the ring, which is a perfectly normal thing to happen. And after Nia had taken Oscar and just chucked her into some stuff, the both of them did get counted out when the referee got to 10. So it was a double count out, a double count out. And afterwards, Oscar still hit the hip attack to Nia Jax to prove that she's the dominant one. But as we have said before, do you know a really good way to make somebody look dominant in a sports presented entertainment television show? Have them win matches and have the commentators, look at my weird arms, have the commentators go, oh, Oscar, the Empress of Tomorrow, and man, that tomorrow's taking a long time to get here. Isn't she so great? She's a worthy champion. But no, double count out, double count out. I feel like this took my time and ate it like a bully stealing my jam sandwiches when I was a kid. And I really wanted those jam sandwiches when I was 12 years old. They look delicious. So don't worry about my old problems. But you should worry about my prediction record because now it's two for two. Thanks a lot, Nia Jax. We then had some more nonsense backstage with Lana and MVP. Because MVP, or Mukvup, as I'm going to call him from now on, Mukvup was going to get some champagne in because he was so excited about the fact that Bobby Lashley was going to win the WWE title later when Lana went up to him and just started to cause a fuss. And look, I appreciate WWE investing their time into this because sometimes they just drop things like weights. This one I actually think we could be a bit quicker with. But Mukvup told Lana to shut up because it's not his decision to ban her from ringside and that she should go and talk to her husband. And Lana was like, what are you talking about? What do you mean, what are you talking We know. We saw Bobby Lashley have this conversation with you. He thinks you're too hot. I mean, he's lying, but that's the point. He thinks you're too hot, so you should stay away from the ring. Did I, did I dream this? Was this my, no it wasn't. Also, given how much better Bobby Lashley has been since he made this decision, surely his wife should understand. No offense, Lana, but I think you should go home and like Miz and Morrison took the mick out of later, just do more of your TikTok dances. We will talk about it. Corey Graves also played some Green Day after this and said it was the official song of Backlash, even though there was around about 72 other songs that were also the official song of Backlash. So I have decided to write the unofficial song of Backlash. Go. Backlash is a show from WWE. It focused on Jeff Hardy. And it's disgusting we, I don't think it went that well. It was just so all over the place. If you want a spoiler, Randy Orton. Kick Edge in the face. Thanks. And then more stupidness. I mean, you can tell that something big happened a few days ago and that there were changes made behind the scenes because we were just getting thrown things here that we had to try and dodge. Because despite everything we'd learned earlier about the Miz Morrison and Braun Strowman and the rules, then we found out you also had to tag in and tag out. So it was a handicap match with triple threat rules. I mean, that makes all the sense in the world, 
No, it doesn't. It was just like we were throwing ideas into a mixing pot, a witch's mixing pot, and she was all like, <laughs> and then whatever came out, we just applied to this. Also, you should have told me on SmackDown. This was kind of unexpected, though, as the Miz and Morrison beat Braun Strowman up far more than I inspected. But what you really want to know is what happened when they could have become Universal Champion, or at least John Morrison could have. Because as the Miz hit the skull crushing finale, like John Morrison came off the rope and also hit a double foot stomp, and he had Braun down for the one, two, three. But apparently Miz's instincts kicked in and he grabbed his friend's foot and pulled him off. And then was like, oh no, what did I did? And he put him back on the monster among men. But by that point, like Braun Strowman's hands had G'd him back up and he threw John Morrison out the ring. He hit the Miz with a choke slam. He then finished Johnny Boy off with the power slam and he is still your universal champion. I don't know why I stopped then. It's like a robot running out of juice. But really it just felt rushed. I didn't think the build had been all that much. And deep down, I kind of hoped that either Miz or John Morrison was going to become the champion, and I don't even know why. It didn't really befit the Universal title, and it's Jimmy Bell. Help me, though. That's three for two in my predictions. Interview with AJ Styles afterwards, which I dug, because not only did we recap his incredible match with Daniel Bryan, but he also said, I'm the best, I'm the champ, I'm going to have a celebration for this on SmackDown, and Daniel Bryan is invited, because he is great, but he's not... Phenomenal, because you know that's AJ Styles' nickname. Also, massive shout out to Samoa Joe here, because we cut back to the commentary team, and he kind of faux congratulated AJ Styles and also wished his family well. Samoa Joe is brilliant. It was then Drew McIntyre and Bobby Lashley, and finally Backlash got back on track, which kind of rhymes. This was really good. Up. And the start rocked too, because before we'd even heard the bell, Bobby Lashley locked on the full Nelson, and everybody freaked out, including the match officials, because they were like, well, nobody can break Bobby Lashley's full Nelson, so what are we to do? And poor Drew was just there, like, floating around like this. It looked like he was done. Eventually, Bobby did let go, because of course he had to, but the story, the seeds, were planted there and then. How was McIntyre going to be overcome this now? His neck must have felt like feathers. And it was pretty competitive, with Bobby mostly getting up a hand when Mukvup kept getting involved, or at least causing a distraction. And some of the things that these two dudes do, especially given their size, was absolutely badass. And we saw a superplex, which I thought was going to destroy the ring. Drew McIntyre is a great champion, and Bobby Lashley was a really good challenger. The cool thing, too, is that Drew never stopped scrapping, and that's absolutely what you want from your champion. He was like a zombie that had just come back from the dead. He really didn't want to die. Lashley eventually went back to the full Nelson, but Drew was able to reverse that into this pretty damn good looking Alabama slam. And then there was just a bunch of reversals and a bunch of counters, which even saw Drew McIntyre lock in a Kimura on his own on Bobby Lashley, but he got to the ropes. A nice little nod there to Brockus Lesnar. And I bet Bobby here wished that he had just thrown himself out of the ring and walked away, because WWE had to give us one of those stupid finishes that this match didn't need at all. Because at this point, out came Lana for no reason whatsoever, and she just walked up the steel stairs and got in the ring and started yelling at the ref, you're cheating, you're cheating, even though he hadn't cheated at all. And then Bobby Lashley got thrown into Lana. She fell onto Mukvup, and then when Lashley turned around, he got Claymore kicked right in the face. Drew McIntyre beat him one, two, three. I have no problem with Drew McIntyre winning, but did we need such schmoz? No, we did not. It schmozzed itself right in to a down. It's just so deflating. It's like you're having this really good competitive match, and then it ends on a whimper. Also, Tom Phillips, you called the Claymore kick the most devastating move in all of sports entertainment. No, it's not. It's a surprise roll-up, and I have a chart to prove this. Drew did win though, so that's another mark for me in the predictions game. I think I then fell asleep and somehow my dreams got broadcast around the world because we had a thing with the Street Profits and Viking Raiders that I could have guessed, I could have guessed what WWE may have done with them at Backlash for 42,000 years and I never in a million years would have written this. So for starters, minutes before Backlash was meant to begin, WWE just went on social media and went, oh, we, did, we forgot to tell you, we are going to have a Raw Tag Team title match at the show. It's going to be the Viking Raiders versus the Street Profits. Don't get mad, don't get upset. I saw so many people going, why didn't we nap this on Raw? I have the answer. Ever wonder why a man is all of a sudden stood in a wood 
even though he was meant to be giving you a review of WWE Backlash 2020 and why he's grown a moustache and then mysteriously lost the moustache, well, I can tell you, sometimes in life, stuff just happens. I mean, you can be doing a video when a moustache then reappears on your forehead, which also makes absolutely no sense, and then it's back to its original position as if the moustache is alive. But has anybody told you why a moustache would be alive? Of course they haven't. So if you are looking for answers, I implore you to call us at 0800 Stuff Just Happens because somebody is always waiting to take your call. And to answer the comments of Simon, why aren't you wearing the Stuff Just Happens t-shirt? Well, sometimes stuff just happens. Or I washed it and it's too wet. One of the two. As it turned out though, there was no actual plan to have a match and instead WWE gave us one of the most bizarre and out of nowhere segments, and that is saying something, I have ever seen with my eyes. And I promise you, I'm not making any of this up. This isn't one of my stupid jokes where I lie. This is truly what happened. It started in the parking lot where the Street Profits and the Viking Raiders were brawling because apparently they're not friends anymore. Fortunately, they then ruined Braun Strowman's car and they were so scared they ran into the performance center where they found a bunch of props from the skits they've been doing. So there was bowling balls and there was turkey legs and all of this madness. The Prophets managed to calm all this down even though it was a ruse and they just then punched Eric and Ivar which kicked the brawl off again. And then Ivar started to daydream about the skits we've just talked about but somehow we could see what he was dreaming about. So we were in his head. And it was about how good he was at bowling. So we took a bowling ball and he bowled it right into Montez's Ford's balls. And all you need to know is this kind of stuff kept happening until Dawkins speared Eric through a glass pane. It looked absolutely brutal. The escalation here was absolutely nuts and we only just started. I honestly thought somebody had drugged me. And if you think this is as random as it gets, you ain't heard nothing. And I'm skipping over this quite fast because just as they were brawling, a man on a motorbike pulled up and he had a helmet on and when he removed it, it was Tazawa who now just has an army of his own who were dressed like ninjas forcing the Street Profits and the Viking Raiders to come together as the Street Vikings, whatever the hell they were called. And then they started to have a big fight and they were able to survive this but Tazawa had something else up his sleeve when this giant man just happened to appear and he had a sword. Then we learned that in kayfabe, Ivar has four magic powers because he summoned a turkey leg much like Thor summons his hammer. And he was going to try and take on this man with a turkey leg even though he had a deadly weapon. But thankfully everybody saw sense and they just led this. I'll speed forward to the end because otherwise we will be here all day. This went on for around about 20-25 minutes. And after they were fighting on a truck and all threw each other into like a skip that was down below, it turns out within the WWE world, Godzilla! I presume exists because a giant tail was then like in the shot and it once again scared them all away. Why was Godzilla here? Why does Godzilla care about the Raw Tag Team Championships? The worst part is no one's ever going to answer me these questions. I am always just going to have to try and understand why a Japanese super baddie thing who has a bunch of movies decided he wanted to win a title in WWE. I am perplexed. We then found out the match wasn't going to be happening because of course it wasn't and I guess I just have to answer the following questions. Was I ever bored during this? No, I was not. Did I laugh out loud a few times? Yes, I did. And was I massively sports entertained? You bet your ass. So while I never thought this would happen in a thousand years, it is getting it up and I actually think it's one of the most confident ups I've ever given. On my Twitter, I was like, Simon, you better give it a down. You better give it a down. No way, man. This was experimental. It was different. And it wasn't planned. Like no one said, oh, I wonder what they're going to do. We were told it was a match and it wasn't. I think I loved it. And I don't even know why. You tell me. We then did get to our main event and smartly WWE had held off the greatest match of all time. Because of course it's the greatest match of all time. You don't put the greatest match of all time in the middle of the card. What is this? McDonald's? I don't know. But I don't think any of us realised that WWE was going to do. Even though word had leaked out that it was pre-taped was actually produce this in the way that they did because they told us it was going to have enhanced audio which basically meant they pumped in cheers and boos as if there was 50,000 people in the crowd. Now look, I will say this, real sports are doing it, you can watch football right now and they are doing the exactly the same thing but I thought this helped 
a whole lot. In fact, I think I absolutely adored it. I will say that the cheers were better than the boos. Sometimes you heard these fake boos and they were a bit jarring. But I even forgot that it was only in front of about 12 people that they picked from the performance center. You obviously can't do this if a match is live, but the more we can do this, we absolutely should. And it was kind of shot from different angles. So it was basically part movie, part wrestling match. And yeah, I got a mighty fine kick out of it. I then laughed as Tom Phillips shouted at the top of his lungs, it's the greatest wrestling match ever, before a punch had been thrown. So he must be a robot that's been sent back in time to review wrestling matches for us. And I suppose we really, really got started after Edge and Randy Orton were on the top rope and Edge headbutted Randy Orton. And when he emerged from the depths, he was busted open. My word, this had the emotion of a fish in the sea. And my word, I was invested like said fish. Plus the match itself flipping rocked. I mean, no, it wasn't the greatest wrestling match ever, but it certainly lived up to that tagline in a certain aspect. Samoa Joe on commentary, oh my gosh, he was on fire. But so were Edge and Randy Orton. Like early on, Edge was giving Randy Orton all these hip tosses, but because he's now a little bit inexperienced and he has all this ring rust, he went for one too many. Randy Orton just stopped in his tracks and he laughed like he was Shredder from the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And this carried on too because Mr. RKO tripped Edge as he was running the ropes. And once again, you were like, oh man, Edge, you've got to find your mojo. Otherwise, you're probably going to be murdered by the Apex Predator. They had stored up their finishes before long and been retooled in the creator system menu because they were busting out Eddie Guerrero suplexes and rock bottoms and unprettiers and pedigrees. And I'm 99% sure me and my brother had this exact same match around about 10 years on the video games. But honestly, the whole thing was just so riveting and it was just so captivating. Edge's selling was something else. Randy Orton was acting like a serial killer. And the commentators kept telling us, kept reminding us, do not forget about the rated R superstar's neck. That thing could break at any time because we remember what happened nine and a half years ago. And Orton didn't care about this. The voices in his head were likely going, break the neck, break the neck, Randy. And Randy was like, yeah, I will voices in my head. I tell you, it was like watching a top ass drama. This just got better and better to the point you have to go and watch it. A bald asshole can only do so much. But even a top rope superplex, it was just so good because Edge acted like he was dead. He had this sort of look on his face like, oh, my neck, my neck. And I was genuinely perturbed perturbed. There was even a spot where Edge was trying numerous versions of the most devastating move of all of sports entertainment, but when they both popped back up, Randy Orton smashed it with an RKO and Edge must have kicked out at around about 2.98. It just gets all the round of applauses. These two dudes are flipping great professional wrestlers. Orton then kicked out of two spears, then he caught Edge coming off the rope with an incredible looking RKO, but deep down you always knew it. How was this going to end? It was going to end with Randy Orton being a dick because he's just such a dick and he's obsessed with the dick clearly because when the referee wasn't looking he whammed Edge right in that area and then of all the things used the punt kick which we haven't seen since about 1412 he ran he slammed Edge right in the head and he slapped his thigh which goes to show Randy Orton knew what he was doing on Twitter he's such a troll and all of it was too much for the former money in the bank man and he got pinned Randy Orton won the greatest wrestling match of all time and Edge was in so much pain here and he was so beat up they even sent a stretcher down he refused it he didn't want it but my word looking at him you were like maybe you should just lay down my friend you have been in a war. Randy also got in Edge's face before all of this saying go home Adam go home because he think he's done and the only really sad news is that it came out afterwards that Edge had actually torn his tricep during this and he's going to be out for a few months but even if he never comes back which of course he will keep everything crossed i'm sure he'll be fine he has reminded us of what a great professional wrestler he is and reminded us that his legacy is almost untouchable he's that good randy orton is that good i know there were lots of bells and whistles here but i don't care was i sports entertained i was sports entertain up the whim wham up the woo ha so here i am gonna break my rules sorry my friends because for the second time in a week the second time it doesn't just get an up it gets the golden up. Fabu, absolutely Fabu. Now I need to go and lay down and try and just remember everything we did here because I'm gonna watch it again. That's right, I mean, I've got things I need to do, but I will watch it again. And overall, I actually thought Backlash wasn't all that great. In fact, it was worse than I was expecting, but the last two matches and the craziness with the Viking Raiders actually means overall it gets an up. When a main event is that good, I ain't gonna crap over it. I'm not that kind of a guy, and sometimes it's more about the journey than the destination, but here it's more about the destination, because when we got to that last match, 
pure flipping fire. Now, don't forget to leave a comment below and let us know what you thought about last night's episode of Backlash. Doesn't make sense. The show known as Backlash, it's not Raw. Like the video, share the video, subscribe to What Culture Wrestling. Then head over to WhatCulture.com, read yourself some articles, follow What Culture on Twitter, What Culture WWE, and watch more videos here on What Culture Wrestling. My name is Simon for What Culture. It's time to sleep. See you soon.